I'm going to be reading tonight from the book of, book of Daniel. Um, but before I, before I get into it, I want to kind of go over the intro, a little introduction, a little backstory of um, the first kind of four chapters. Uh, just so we kind of understand the, the story and the history of Daniel and uh, so that the Holy Spirit can speak to us tonight. So in the very first chapter of Daniel, it talks about how Daniel and his three friends, uh, they were captured with Israel. All of Israel was captured and they went into captivity by Babylon. And at the time, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and God allowed Israel, his children, to go into captivity because they were worshiping idols, because they were uh, far from God. They were departed from God, and they weren't following God. So a lot of times, God in, in, the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and even today in the New Testament, we see that he takes the tough love approach. He allows his people, us, to go through certain trials, certain hardships in our lives so that we can hit rock bottom in a sense, realize that we needed God all along and turn back to him. And so he allowed his people to go into captivity. And uh, Daniel and his three friends, uh, they were part of David's royal families. They, they were in the, in the court. They were in the king's palace. They were serving the king. They were very wise, the Bible says. And um, they were royalty. So they chose Nebuchadnezzar told these people hey find like the wisest uh young good looking men I want them to serve me we're going to train them for like three years I'm going to give them the best foods my wine the delicacies of the king and I'm going to train them so they can serve me and uh, we see that um if you guys have some those pictures you guys can put them up because I'm a visual person I like I kind of understand better visually so I have some a couple of pictures for you guys so when they were captured, these, uh, these Daniel and these, these men, his friends, um, they rejected the king's food. It says that uh, Daniel rejected it and he said, hey, we don't want to eat uh, the king's food. Because, you know, Jewish people, they were very uh, selective with their foods, what they ate. If they ate meat, it had to be kosher, it had to be slaughtered a certain way, or else it, wasn't un uh, it was unclean. And they didn't want to defile themselves. So they told um, the servant, said, hey, we're not going to eat the food. And the servant told uh, Daniel, he was like, if, if, if you guys look sick, I'm going to get in trouble. And I'm going to get killed for not taking care of you guys. And Daniel's like, hey, just test us. For 10 days, we just want to eat water and vegetables and then make a decision. And after 10 days, it says that they looked healthier than everyone else. So they allowed them um, to eat their diet. I thought that was really interesting. But we see this pattern of, of Daniel and his friends, how in the middle of their prison, you can say, in the middle of their captivity, they were surrounded by evil. They were surrounded by pagans. They were surrounded by ungodly people, and they, they didn't give in. They, still, they, they stayed steadfast in their faith, they were like, we don't care what, what surrounds us. We don't care if the enemy surrounds us. We don't care if we're living in the, dev, in the devil's den. We're not going to go back. To, we're not going to turn from our ways. We're not going to give in to the world. We're not going to give in to sin. We're going to stand firm on God and our relationship with God. And I love that about Daniel. And, and I, I truly believe that's why God allowed this, this story of, of this man to be in the Bible. Because his heart was so pure before God. He wouldn't allow any unclean thing in his life. He didn't care what, what the pressure was at the time. He was like, I'm, I'm going to stand close to God. And I'm going to stand on my principles. Um, then Nebuchadnezzar has a troubling dream. And it says that none of his magicians can interpret it. So he starts killing all the wise men. You guys can go to them. Yeah, there you go. So he starts killing all the wise men because he gets upset. And he's like, how come you guys can't interpret this dream? You know, he was really troubled by this dream about the statue that was destroyed by this rock. And it was just, he couldn't sleep, it says. So he called all the wise men, all the magicians, all the smartest people. Nobody could figure it out. So he's like, okay, just start killing all these people. He got really, really fed up with them. And it um, says that Daniel and his friends were next. And they knew that they were going to die 
if God didn't do something. So they started praying. They started praying for God's mercy. And God interprets the dream to Daniel in a night vision. It says God shows him the dream exactly. Because Nebuchadnezzar didn't even tell the wise men what the dream was. He's like, I want you guys to tell me what I dreamt and explain it to me. So he, he, he would know that none of them were making things up and making up false interpretations. So they needed a straight-up miracle from God. There's no way Daniel could have went up there and tried to figure something out and say, oh, because he didn't have a clue as to what this guy dreamt. And uh, God shows Daniel the dream, interprets it to him, and Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar. And then Nebuchadnezzar, the king at the time, he promoted all of them to a very high position. And Nebuchadnezzar, the first time, for the first time, acknowledges God. He says, wow, your, guy, your guys' God is real. Daniel's God is a real God. Only God could have showed you. Only the real God could have showed you the secrets of my heart. He acknowledges God. But then it's very interesting because the next chapter, I don't know how much time passed by. It doesn't say. It says that Nebuchadnezzar made a huge statue, a huge golden image of himself. And he makes a law, a decree, and he tells everyone, to worship the statue when they, when they sound the trumpets, uh, or else they'll all be killed. He tells the whole kingdom of Babylon, when the, when the sound of the horns and all these instruments play, everyone has to bow down, everyone has to worship this idol, this image of me. And if you guys don't, you'll be killed. You know, this guy was a tyrant. This guy was, you know, um, very extreme, very extreme king. And uh, Daniel's friends... We all know the story of Shidrach, um, Meshach, and Abednego. Those names are hard. Those are actually not even the real names, uh, but they were given those names uh, by the Babylonians. And they were like, no, we're not going to bow down to this idol. So the people see, and they tell Nebuchadnezzar, look what um, these guys, your, your high-ranking officials are doing. They're uh, making you look bad in front of everybody. They're making you look weak. And he, he didn't want to. But he, he was like, I have to hold my law. He had to, he, you know, as a king, you can't look weak. And you have to uphold the law that you put forth. So he's like, okay, I have to, they have to be thrown into the fire. And um, when they were thrown into the fire, nothing happens to them. And not only that, Nebuchadnezzar said that he saw a fourth man in there that looked like the son of God or the son of man. And he was shocked and he ran over there and he tells them to come out. And they come out and it says that, their clothes weren't burned. They didn't even smell like the fire. They didn't, not even the smoke of smell was on them. And Nebuchadnezzar again was shocked and he realized and he acknowledged God. Again, he said, this God is real and this God is amazing. And he's, he's acknowledging the wonders of God. And he's saying, wow, what an amazing God. Daniel's God. No one, and, he's, and then he said, no one better ever talk bad about their God ever again, this, that. He's very moved by this, uh, by this miracle. And then uh, we keep seeing this pride, this, this pattern of pride come up in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Um, again, and this is where we're going to read a little bit, but again, um, so God allows, oh, well, actually, let's, let's read it first real fast. Let's jump to uh, Daniel chapter 4, starting with verse 19. If you guys have your Bibles, let's all open up and read together. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 19. This is the second dream right after the, uh, the situation happened with um, the fire. This is right, right after. Again, we don't know how long the timeline was, but this is the next chapter. It says, Then Daniel, whose name, whose name was Belshazzar, that was his Babylonian name, was astonished for a time. And his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to all the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, under which the beasts of the fields dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. 
And as much as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him gaze with the beast of the field till seven times passes over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives you and gives it to whomever he chooses. And in as much as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. If we skip a few verses, uh, exactly what Daniel tells him, that dream God interprets again to Daniel. And he's saying this, he interprets the dream of that big tree that was so abundant, that was giving fruit, that was so powerful, God's going to chop it down and show you that he is the most high. And God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to lose his mind. For seven years, he became like an animal, if you guys have that image. For seven years, it says he became like an animal. He was um, outside eating grass. And his, his servants, they were kind of just taking care of him. They're, they didn't know what to do. So they were just, he, like, he, they couldn't control him. He was like a wild animal. God allowed him to lose his mind. And then we'll jump to verse 34. It says, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are the truth, and his ways justice, and who walk in pride, he's able to put down. Amen. So I want to I wanna speak about pride tonight. Sorry, that was a long intro, but I wanted to kind of get an understanding of what's going on here, how dangerous pride can be in our lives as, as Christians, the, the danger of pride. And we see this pattern in his life, how he keeps, he acknowledges God, and then he keeps going back to his ways. He keeps going back to his ways, and right after he sees God working, he's like, let's build an image of me, and again, he's going back to his pride, and then again, he sees God, and again, right before he lost his mind, it says he's walking in the palace after Daniel told him his second dream, and, he's, and he was just admiring all his work. He's like, look at this kingdom, look at all that I've accomplished, look at all my majesty, everything I have, and then right then, he loses his mind for seven years. But it's amazing how God loves us, how God, after seven years, poured out his grace and, and still wanted to restore Nebuchadnezzar, even though he wasn't a, the chosen people of God, even though he was a, a pagan, a Gentile at the time. God was showing himself, even in the Old Testament, his ultimate plan was to save all of humanity. And he was, he was doing this and showing an example to Nebuchadnezzar. And... Um, It's amazing that Nebuchadnezzar accepted the call of God. And finally, after he, God restored his mind, he's, he finally repented. He stopped acknowledging God, and he surrendered everything. He, he, he repented and followed God, you know. Um, and I just want to, you know, I have a few points, just a few points uh, about pride and the dangers of pride. Uh, we keep seeing this pattern come up of, of pride in Nebuchadnezzar's life. And even his son, Belshazzar, after um, I'm sure you guys all heard the story. He was having a feast, and they were drinking from the golden cups uh, that they stole from Israel, God's temple, uh, the, the cups that were in God's temple, and then a hand 
was written on the wall. And long story short, that night, his son was killed. And we keep seeing this pattern in Nebuchadnezzar's life and his son, uh, Belshazzar. And we have to be aware of pride in our lives. Because pride creeps up a lot of times. You know, n- none of us here are kings. <laughs> but, uh, but we can all relate with pride. We can all relate with pride. And it's something that's, I, I think, just instilled in our character at a young age. You know, um, everyone kind of tells you as a kid, stand up for yourself. You know, uh, s- stick and hold to your traditions, you know. Um, and you, you're kind of just, as you grow up as, as, a, as a child and then become an adult, you kind of just get this pride. It's a pride of life, the Bible talks about it. I mean, you know, we all go through trials, we go through accomplishments, you know, we all uh, um, overcome a lot of things and naturally we become proud of ourselves. Like, man, I, you know, I've been through a lot, I've, I've grown a lot, I've, I've uh, accomplished so many things and we start to kind of get proud, you know. But we have to be very dangerous and acknowledge pride in our hearts. Uh, I looked up the definition of pride. It says, it's a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. So pride comes in many forms, you know. And if we're not attentive, if we're not careful, if we don't watch out for pride, it could creep up in our hearts very fast. And it, it can become part of us, part of who we are, our character. Um, and then I guess uh, I have a question. Why is pride so dangerous? You know, why is this sin such a dangerous sin? Because we see a lot of people um, in the Bible mention it so many times. Um, pride is a sin that separates us from God. The Bible says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble in James. Lucifer was an angel before he became Satan, and uh, he wanted to be greater than God. And then I, I saw this quote. It says, of the seven deadly sins, theologians and philosophers reserve a special place for pride. Lust, envy, anger, greed, gluttony, and sloth are all bad, but the sages say pride is the deadliest of all, the root of all evil, and the beginning of sin. Why, why do they say that? Why do all philosophers, you know, and why, how do they come up with this saying, you know? Like, I just mentioned Lucifer before he became Satan. We all, we all know the story, you know? Pride entered his heart. He was like, man, why do I have to be second in charge? Or why do I have to, you know, lead the choir? I want to be like God, and I want to be better than God. And we see that, that pride, it's, it's no, no longer depending on God, but it's, it's depending on ourselves now. That, that's the root of pride. It's, it's having a trust in yourself having that thinking to yourself like i can do better i don't need god i i have myself i can figure things out it's it's always about me 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 it's it's comes back to your self-centeredness it's the root of our our flesh taking god's place exactly we we think that we can do it better and we want to be the center of attention and so that's why they say that pride is the root of all evil because it leads to sin we need to humble ourselves and repent like Nebuchadnezzar before God humbles us, and it's going to hurt when God humbles us. And, and I can share that from personal, personal experience, you know. A lot of you maybe don't know my story. I used to be a drug addict 10 years ago, and I was fighting and fighting, and I was trying to set myself free. I was trying, and then I finally went to this Christian rehab center, and God changed my life. But when I when I repented and, and got a relationship with God, God was showing me the real roots, the real reasons why I ended up in drugs. It wasn't because I was trapped or persuaded or fell into peer pressure. It was because of my pride. And God had to show that for me that at a young age, I started rebelling. I became a very proud teenager. And I thought I knew better. I knew better than my parents. I started rebelling. I was like, I don't need anyone to tell me anything. I know what I'm doing. I want to live my life. I want to have fun. I want to and God was showing me that from a young age, pride entered my heart. And I was just, it was growing. And it was growing. And I liked it. And I liked what, how pride made me feel. I liked that. I was like, I'm my own person. I can do whatever I want. It's a spirit of rebellion. And that, all, that pride ultimately led me to drug addiction. That pride is what destroyed my life. 
because it, it, it blinded me into thinking that I can do it. I don't need God. I can do it better than God. I don't need somebody to tell me what to do. I'll do it myself. And that, that is the, the ultimate sin. It's just a sin of witchcraft. It's a sin of rebellion. It's just anti-God, anti, just everything anti-God. And so when we don't humble ourselves, God will allow certain things to humble us. If, if we don't want to come to God on our own power, then God will allow certain things like a drug addiction to break you completely, to come crawling back to him and say, God, I know you're real and I need you, or, or, or anything else. You name it. Look at the, the, the story we just read, how God broke Nebuchadnezzar, humbled him like a wild beast to finally show Nebuchadnezzar, you need me. Stop, stop just acknowledging me, but actually repent and have a relationship with me. That, that's the danger that we all fall into. We're, 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 you know, it's, we have wishful thinking. You know? We like to compare ourselves to Daniel and his friends. We like to think oh, we're the wise guys that would you know, stand strong in the face of opposition. We're actually more like Nebuchadnezzar most of the time. We acknowledge God. We see miracles. We see testimonies in our lives. We see God working. And we're like, wow, God is so real. And that's it. It stops there. We just acknowledge him. But we don't actually repent and do the steps that we don't surrender everything. We just keep acknowledging, acknowledging God is so good, God is so merciful. And then we go back and we go back and we go back. And God, God has mercy on us, but we keep turning our backs on him. And we keep disrespecting God. Because every time he just continues to pull us out. Every time we think we got it, I can do it, I don't need God. And then what happens? few days go by maybe even a few hours and God's like again okay I'll pull you out and he loves us so much but we're not doing our part and I'm guilty of this I know I am I know all of us struggle with this that we struggle with our pride we struggle with thinking that we can do it on our own we got it we know the answers we know everything we've heard all the sermons we grew up in Sunday school whatever but still, we don't fully surrender to God. And that's where that pride creeps in and, and, and departs us from God. I have an application for us. Let's, uh, let's examine our lives and think for a second, where do I have pride? Because all of us have it somewhere. Where do I have pride? Maybe in our accomplishments, the things that we've been through in our lives, maybe our businesses, uh, our jobs, uh, maybe it's our talents, maybe it's our looks, maybe uh, it could be anything, I don't know. But let's, let's really sit and think, where is the pride in my life? And ask God, Holy Spirit, show me. Where do I have pride? Where do I need to repent and fully surrender in, in my life? What do I need to surrender in my life? And um, we can stand up. I'm going to close with this. I have a question. How about when we're jealous? That's, that's pride right there. When we're jealous, when we hate on somebody because they're more successful than us or maybe they have things that we want that we don't have. When you're jealous and, and you talk bad about people and you're, you have hatred towards people, that is pride. When you gossip about people, that is pride. That's something we're all gu guilty of. When you look down on people and you say, oh, look at what they're doing, this and that, and you think you're better, that's, that's pride. That's pride creeping up in our hearts. Let's go into this, this prayer right now. And uh, let's take a minute. Don't rush, because I know we always kind of like want to rush and get on with the service. But let's really kind of be still like they were singing earlier. Just be still and check our hearts. Where is this pride? I know all of us have a pride that we struggle with. And really ask God to show us, to remove it from our hearts, remove it from our minds. And let's rebuke any jealousy or spiteful thoughts that we have against anyone because it is poison and ultimately it will lead us to sin. Let's ask Jesus to break every chain in our lives because ultimately he's the only one. We need Jesus to break those chains in our lives. We need Jesus to break pride out of our lives. We need him to give us a spirit of humility. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit. And we all struggle with that. But if we acknowledge it and don't do anything about it, then we're just going to keep going back in that same pattern. We need to acknowledge it and surrender it and ask God to, to really check our hearts right now and ask him to, to, to move in our hearts. Let's pray.